Okay, linear algebra two. The way I see it, linear algebra has three main ingredients. I call them three pillars of linear algebra. The first one is subspaces. What goes into, what belongs to the pillar of subspaces? All of the discussions having to do with dimension. And of course, linear dependence and linear independence are the hallmark concept of the pillar of subspaces. And of course, the solution of linear systems, AX equals B, is squarely in here. And the concept of a particular solution and a general solution and linear decomposition and probably a few other things. But essentially, counting dimensions, counting subspaces, that's what this is. And you can learn to solve these equations and even throw in matrix multiplication and talk about null spaces and all of those things without talking about anything else. And then you start talking about transformations, which are these operations that take a vector and return a vector and have the linear property, linear transformations. And here, probably the central concept is that of eigenvalues. And we write it as AX equals lambda X. Some people would say the most important notion in linear algebra. I kind of think all of them are equally important and work together. But this is where we learn about reflections and projections, and we learn to think of the derivative as a linear transformation, because remember, our idea, our approach is to describe uh, linear algebra ideas as applicable to all kinds of objects. So that's what goes here, and in our class, you may have stopped elsewhere. This is where we stopped. So conspicuously, conspicuously absent is the notion of length. We have never ever mentioned length. And you might disagree with that and say, but remember, in each one of these examples, when you talked about geometric vectors, you would use length and also orthogonality and angles. So you did say length. You said rotation preserves the length, or you said, Reflection is when you flip it the other way and it's the same length and whatever. You did say length. And it's true. But I limited the discussion of lengths and angles strictly to geometric vectors. When we were talking about elements of R3, which is triplets of numbers or entiples of numbers, and that may have been the primary focus in the course that you took, but in our course, I did not allow to use the word length even if you wanted to say that the square root of the sum of squares of those numbers is length. Some of you may have had that temptation. In fact, we worked very hard to break that association. And I was very adamant about don't say length. I was calling it treating all objects on their own terms. Don't say length, don't say angles, don't say orthogonal, because triplets of numbers or sets of n numbers are just that. You cannot take a tape measure to them. That's what our length was, something that you can measure with a tape measure. That's length. Vectors in Rn did not have length. They didn't have angles. And of course, polynomials didn't have lengths and angles. Right? What's the length of the polynomial x minus 1? It's a ridiculous question. Do you agree? Except, of course, it's not at all ridiculous. And that's the whole point of the third pillar in a product. What we're going to do now which is so central to virtually all of applied mathematics, is to bring the concept of length from geometric vectors to all others, to Rn and to polynomials and to, all, and to electrical signals and to displacements and to strains and to stresses and to currents and to heart signals, everything, and to electrical fields. We have to bring the concept of length why do, we have to why do we have to bring in the concept of length? Well, there are very, very many compelling reasons. But one of them is that you sometimes have to, especially if you're coming from calculus or if you're an engineer, you have to discuss proximity. This solution is close enough to that one. Let me throw out a linear system, since it has to do with subspaces, and put a linear system like this. One, two, three. Uh, I might even go four, five, six. 
x, y equals 1, 0, 0. Okay, very nice system. Has no solutions. Who agrees? Well, it's not likely to have a solution because we only have two vectors in a three-dimensional space. What are the chances that the vector on the right-hand side falls into the same subspace? If it does, we got lucky. If it doesn't, and that will be the typical situation, the likely situation here, no solutions. And we had no choice but to leave it at that. But as an engineer, this is a very common situation, and you want to find an approximate solution. And in this case, there is no solution, right? <coughs> because the middle, at, the middle entry is the average of the other two, the middle entry is the average of the other two, the middle entry is not the average of the other two. That's how we reasoned in the first linear algebra course. Okay. We had to leave it at that, but we don't want to. We'll say, okay, we'll just take a solution that's close enough. We can't get 1, 0, 0. How close can we get? And without additional concepts, but these first two pillars, we're not even equipped to begin answering that question because we don't have a concept of close enough. For geometric vectors, we do. We'll just take a tape measure and say, it's close enough. But for any other kind of vectors, and I'm very adamant about these at this point, we're not, we don't even have a concept of length. So we have to have a concept of length. That's the goal. Now, you will notice that if I look at the analogous problem, this is a problem in decomposition, right? With geometric vectors, I will be able to answer it. This will be a topic that we'll cover in a couple of weeks, probably, more like four, and it will be called least squares. That's what, if you've ever heard the term least squares, it applies <coughs> So a problem like this, where before we said doesn't have a solution. But let's just for fun, just to be a little bit more motivated to take the concept of length from geometric vectors and bring it over to other spaces, let's consider the analogous problem among geometric vectors. Maybe we'll even do it here. I'm basically asking you to take two vectors that lie in some plane I'm not saying these vectors lie in any plane. These are triplets of numbers. They don't lie in any plane. They're triplets of numbers. They don't lie. They are. That's all they are. But this is vectors in some plane. Okay, they span this plane. And I'm asking you to decompose a third vector that's not in this plane. And you can't do it. You agree? So you see the picture, this is a plane, and then this points out of the plane, the yellow. And I'm asking you to decompose the yellow vector as a linear combination of the two white ones. And the correct linear algebra response is that it's not possible. Yes, Josh. Yes, and you would have to use one more word. You would have to say orthogonal projection. Right? So you see, angles are involved. That's exactly right. So. This question we can intuitively answer because no matter what linear combination of these two vectors we evaluate, we will not get the yellow one, right? We can't get out of the plane. We spend hours talking about just that. We can't get out of the plane, so how could we get this vector that's out of the plane? But we can, at least on an intuitive level, totally talk about the closest we can get. And would you all agree with me that this is not the closest? Right, because the closest would be over there. Okay, this is not the closest. This is not the closest. The closest is what Jag said. You have to find this point here so that, uh, can I do a better drawing? Boom. This is the closest we can get, where this is the right angle all around. How do I draw the right angle? Like this? Yeah, is that what you, you know, I don't want to put it right, it's because perspective, so I can't go down. Right? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. You see what I'm saying? Do you guys all agree that's the closest I can get? Right, if this is my plane and this is my vector, then the closest I can get is right under the tip of my fingerprint, 
So you kind of have to go in the orthogonal direction. <clears throat> so in other words, that's the point. This is the point that's closest to this one. What does closest mean? Length. I need the concept of length. So I want to do the exact same thing here. I want to say within this span, <clears throat> within the column space, what's the closest I can get to this? And I'm not equipped to answer that question. And your first temptation, because you've been bombarded with this perspective, is to take the square root of the sum of squares to define how big a vector is in R3. And that answer is not incorrect. That's the most I'll give it. It's not incorrect. And it's, so it's correct. <laughs> but there are many more correct answers. There are many other correct answers. Remember how we always push this egalitarian point of view, that not one basis is better than another. All bases are created equal, until you have a specific problem which makes one basis more convenient than another. So here, it will be the same situation here. There are many lengths. There are many things that you can define as a length and say that's length. For example, instead of the sum of squares, you can put the coefficient 2 in front of one of them, right? right? 2x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And that would be just as good from a certain point of view. So once we define what length means, we'll be able to at least specify what it means to solve this problem. How you would do it is an entirely different matter, but at least we'll be able to specify what it means to solve it. And it will mean to find such x and y so that the distance equivalent to length between the, the target vector and the vector that you get out of this linear combination is as small as possible. So we need distance. And once you have distance, you have all of other things, orthogonality and stuff like that. But how do you define distance? So I know the instinct of very many of you. If you're coming from physics, you don't even give it, a, or engineering, you don't even give it a second thought. Okay? Square root of sum of squares. So I will adamantly oppose it as the length. It's a length. But think about this. We also need to define lengths for things like polynomials. One of the applications that we'll discuss is Gaussian integration. Do you remember the second video? Maybe by the time somebody watches this, it will no longer be the second video. There'll be many more. But one of the early videos in linear algebra was on Gaussian quadrature, Gaussian integration, where by measuring a function at just 10 points, you could evaluate its integral to, I don't remember, 15 digits, insane accuracy. That has to do <clears throat> with polynomials and lengths of polynomials and angles between polynomials. And how would you define the length of x squared minus x plus 3? How would you define the length? Square the coefficients and take the square root? I wouldn't do that. That seems very, rather arbitrary, right? Not an easy question. Well, that's not how you get at it. That's what I'm trying to do. So that's what I'm trying to get at. Get at. The way it's done is not by defining length directly. Attempts were probably made and abandoned. The way you introduce length for various linear spaces is through the concept of inner products, which for geometric vectors are called scalar products. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to review scalar products as they apply to geometric vectors. And that will give us a clue on how to carry that over to other spaces. And we will learn that the inner product is much more fundamental than length, and that things like lengths and angles follow from the inner product. And it will be simple, except it's opposite of what you're used to, and that will take some getting used to. Okay, so I will now erase the board, and we'll talk about uh, inner products, or scalar products for geometric vectors.